All right, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our comparative ocular pathology rounds. Um, I am Jamie Miller, one of the pathologists here at COPA, and I'm gonna get us started today. Maybe, maybe, there we go, okay. All right, um, so this first case <clears throat> is from a 13-year-old uh, domestic short hair cat. She's female spade. Um, she presented on emergency as she was non-sighted in both eyes and had glaucoma present in both eyes. Um, they said that the right eye had a stromal corneal ulcer and abnormal tissue protruding temporally to super, superior temporally. And so they enucleated the right eye. And at enucleation, the, there was abnormal tissue also noted in the lateral orbit. Um, the IOP in this right eye that we received was 25, um, but the IOP in the other eye was 42. And I guess, according to the owner, this has been going on for about a month. Um, so grossly, ooh, no peeking. Um, so this is a hemisection of the globe here. Uh, we've got uh, cornea at the top. Uh, the lids are still uh, here in place. And here is this mass dorsally. Um, it was um, a white mass. It was really firm right in here. You can see maybe a, a texture uh, difference between some of the softer tissue around it. Um, here is our uh, lens and most of the inside of the globe uh, looked um, not too bad here. Uh, we did also receive um, a couple pieces of tissue free in the jar, presumably um, from that abnormal tissue that they noted um, in the orbit. So, all right. So, let's see if I can do. Uh, so there's here, it's kind of a really big slide. So you'll have to bear with me here for just a minute. All right. All right, so cornea here at the top, here is the mass uh, that was dorsal. You can see some nice solid areas um, of tissue. Uh, we've got some brighter pink and even some mineralized areas here. Um, and it extends to the tissue margins here. Uh, the globe itself, um, we can see that there's a little bit of hypercellularity here in the cornea that we'll take a look at. Um, here's our uveal tract or iris leaflets. We've got some stuff kind of over the pupil. Um, and then back around the back of the globe, um, here is our optic nerve and we can see um, a little cavity here and some cupping. So we'll look at all that stuff closer. All right, so we'll start up dorsally here with our mass. Um, so it's an unencapsulated mass, seems fairly well demarcated on these sections here that we have, but again, does extend to the tissue margins. Got some hyper eosinophilic uh, trabecula here that we'll take a closer look at. Um, got some necrosis um, and then our more solid areas. And so if we take a look here closer, focus. Um, we've got some uh, streams and kind of sometimes whirls and sort of a little herringbone pattern of these spindle to maybe even polygonal cells. Um, they have indistinct cell borders, a little bit of eosinophilic cytoplasm, Nuclei are kind of round oval, finely stippled chromatin, um, and one to two maybe nucleoli. Uh, mitotic figures uh, were pretty readily uh, found. I think I got over 100 um, on the mitotic count. Go. All right. And then we have some regions where we have our loss of cellular detail, so necrosis. And if we wander back over here, we have these trabeculae of extracellular matrix that's hyper eosinophilic, and we've got the neoplastic cells 
uh, kind of interspersed in between them. Um, and so this is uh, woven bone production and there's little foci of this sort of scattered around the mass um, consistent with osteoid and osteoid production of these neoplastic cells. Um, so we have this spindle to polygonal cell population producing osteoid. Um, and so we call this an osteosarcoma. And then if we head back to the globe and start looking at the other findings here, we'll start on this side and kind of follow this along. Our cornea here, um, we can follow the epithelium along and then we lose it. And so it's uh, broadly ulcerated actually. Uh, there is some neutrophils and blood vessels that are infiltrating. And then if we keep following along, we can see this dense infiltrate of neutrophils. And then all of a sudden we hit a spot where it's very posicellular and we don't have any more of inflammatory cells or the keratocytes here. And so um, this is uh, area of necrosis or corneal sequestrum. And if we ignore the folds in the cornea, that happens sometime and we come over here um, to the edge where we start to pick up the corneal epithelium again, uh, we have this little uh, epithelial downgrowth of um, the corneal epithelium into the corneal stroma, uh, which is our histologic evidence of collagenolysis um, or stromomalacia. Um, so a melting uh, corneal ulcer um, that likely attribute, uh, contributed to its progression of the ulceration here. Um, and again, lots of blood vessels and neutrophils coming in here as well. Um, then let's see, so here we have angle, we've got iris and we've got just some fibrin and neutrophils um, in the anterior chamber. And this is what was sort of spanning um, the pupil here. Got some free aortociliary epithelium kind of hanging around. Um, the lens I think was fairly okay. And then if we head back um, to the optic nerve here, um, interestingly on the opposite side of the globe, so like the ventral portion here, um, there's this uh, cavernous atrophy of the optic nerve head here. And we have this eosinophilic material uh, that's kind of trapped within it. And this is like the vitreous kind of protruding into the um, cavern. Um, this is known as uh, Schnabel's, Schnabel's cavernous atrophy here. And if we look at the ventral retina here, we can see uh, that we don't really have any ganglion cells left and sort of some atrophy out here of the inner retina. Um, which was a little surprising, I guess. Um, the other side of the retina, we can still pick up a decent number of ganglion cells. Um, so that was kind of interesting because um, we didn't really have um, internal reasons for glaucoma, but we do have a large mass um, that was probably compressing on the globe. Um, and so we were curious, um, maybe this is compression atrophy. Um, kind of an optic neuropathy sort of causing the glaucoma um, or the high IOP inside the, um, inside the globe. Uh, it doesn't really explain the glaucoma in the other eye, uh, especially since the mass was reported as being lateral. Um, maybe if it was medial, it could have been affecting both optic nerves, causing maybe a similar lesion in the other eye, but um, so not really sure um, how that all fits together. Uh, for that. Um, and then just briefly, the little tissues uh, that we got um, in the cassettes, or no, they were free in the jar, um, excuse me, um, was again, presumably from the orbit, um, there was really no anatomic location or distinct features here, um, but it's mostly just tumor as was seen um, in the eye there. So, and then lots and lots of necrosis um, as well.
Um, so again, uh, osteosarcoma, probably um, orbital, maybe coming from that lateral skull there, um, suggested that they should do advanced imaging of the head um, to see um, if they can find where it was coming from definitively. Um, and then uh, secondary changes in the eye, um, the um, ulcer and, um, uh, and stuff going on in the cornea. Um, I did forget hmm? the sequestrum. Yes, thank you. Um, I did not, I forgot to show you the symblepharon um, in the cat. Um, let me go back and show that really quick. Um, um, which also could have been a reason for corneal disease. Oh, here we go. Here we go. Um, so our corneal epithelium is coming in here in our conjunctival epithelium and they kind of merge and they form this little um, prong of epithelium that kind of dives down here. Um, and that's um, indicative of symblepharon. Um, we can see that in um, herpes virus infections. Um, as well. So um, herpes virus could have been attributing to the corneal disease, um, but it's also likely that it's maybe secondary from exposure from um, the mass pushing on the globe. So um, so, um, yes, so I haven't heard anything back on if they've done advanced imaging um, about the, the mass, but uh, that was pretty interesting. Um, and I don't think we know too much about osteosarcoma. It's, it's kind of a uncommon location or uncommon for, in, especially in cats there, so. All right. Next up, um, I've got an uh, eyeball from a seven-year-old male neutered um, Boston Terrier dog uh, that uh, came with a history of um, uh, that uh, the patient was hit in the eye um, with a ball uh, while playing with the owner. It apparently bounced off the ground and hit the dog in the eye. Um, we found this fascinating, uh, crazy bouncy ball um, on the internet um, and just imagining what maybe would have happened uh, since it was advertised of having a fascinating erratic bounce, um, supposedly to make it more entertaining for um, the dogs that chase it down. Um, but just um, thought that was kind of fun. Um, and so um, they did try to do some treatment on it, um, but removed it after about uh, a week. Um, and clinically, yes, they said there was um, hyphema that was settled, filling about 75% of the anterior chamber, um, some mild hemorrhagic discharge, um, blepharospasm, scleral injunction, conjunctival hyperemia, and they weren't able to see um, inside the eye. Um, and they said there was posterior lens luxation and retinal detachment noted on their ocular ultrasound. Uh, so uh, again, this is our hemisection of the globe. Here's our cornea up here. Uh, we can see that the globe is just is filled with hemorrhage here. Here is our lens kind of falling away, uh, being posteriorly luxated. Here's our retinal detachment that they saw on the ultrasound here. Um, and then on cut section, you notice that we can follow the sclera here. And then there's an abrupt stop here and a big gap here. Um, so consistent with the scleral rupture, um, probably um, from the trauma from the ball to the eye. All right. So again, here we have our cornea up top, all the hemorrhage filling the uh, anterior chamber here. Here is our iris. Um, we didn't get a sample of pupil and that's why it's kind of extending all the way across the globe here. Um, we can follow the sclera out over here. 
And we can see a little break. There's a little bit light blue tissue in here. We'll take a look at. And here's our detached retina uh, coming in here to our optic nerve. Here we go. All right. Here's our cornea. And we will go ahead. Again, we'll follow the sclera around here. Um, and here is our break. You can see nice little rounded edges to the sclera here. And it is filled with uh, fibrin and hemorrhage. Uh, we've got uh, a little bit of our uveal tract pigmentation here that's kind of coming out. Um, so a little bit of prolapse. Um, and we can see lots of spindle cells in here trying to hold everything together um, as a reaction. We follow out here, uh, we have some muscle cells that are undergoing some regeneration. Um, so we can see the increase in basophilia to the um, sarcoplasm of the muscle. And we can see this nice nuclear rowing um, seen with regeneration in skeletal muscle. Uh, so that's always fun to see in section. And then the fibrosis kind of extends a little bit uh, towards the back of the globe and continues on there. All right, and then if we head back here, um, gonna come here to the limbal area here. So we've got cornea here, decimates ends here. There should be the base of the iris here, but it is pulled away and elevated is kind of floating into the anterior chamber here, as well as the ciliary body. And then underneath it, we have all this um, fibrin and hemorrhage and stuff. Um, so this is indicative of cyclodialysis where the iris and uh, ciliary body get pulled off um, from trauma here. And then lots of hemorrhage inside the eye, uh, not too surprising with the uh, trauma um, and our retinal detachment here, pretty diffuse. And if we take a closer look, at the retina. Um, it's also torn. It's got some rounded edges, which helps us um, differentiate an uh, in vivo tear of the retina versus uh, an artifact, which would have more sharp, uh, sharply demarcated edges. Um, and then we have this loss of architecture and just replacement by fibrin and necrotic debris. Uh, so there's a lot of necrosis here in this ventral um, sclera, uh, sorry, ventral retina um, on the side where the, the rupture was and lots of hemorrhage too as well. Um, our lens, lens capsule was intact. Um, there's some cataractus change here. Um, so, um, and here is our optic nerve head. It's a Again, a little bit of necrosis from the retina coming in. It's a bit um, distorted from the retinal detachment, um, but the optic nerve itself uh, looks pretty good. Um, so uh, just a, a nice classic uh, trauma case. Um, um, so we had the uh, sclera rupture um, and all the fibrosis in the um, surrounding tissues, some myofiber regeneration, the cyclodialysis from the trauma with the iris and ciliary body being um, forcibly removed um, from its normal location and all the intraocular hemorrhage, uh, retinal detachment and the tear and the hemorrhage and necrosis to go along with the blunt force trauma um, that occurred to the eye. So just a nice classic vision of trauma. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Clemens, I believe he's next. Oh, nope, Dr. Shaw. All righty. Hello, I am Gillian Shaw, one of the pathologists in Coplow. All right, uh, the next case that will be shared is, um, we actually got both eyes from a one-year-old red-tailed hawk of unknown sex. Um, the history we got was um, blind bilaterally, trace flare 
rare clumped cell in the anterior chamber, few areas of clumped vitreal hemorrhage in the left eye, uh, white slash dark green slash black subretinal exudate with fibrous tracts in both eyes, suspect West Nile virus. Um, so we actually received both eyes. So I'm pretty sure they had euthanized this bird. And uh, we received both eyes. I only took, all right, well, actually I can't remember who grossed it, but anyway, there's only a picture of one of them, um, which is what we have here. So obviously cornea at the top, um, you might obviously recognize right off the bat that this is an oddly shaped eye. And that is when you have the mammalian perspective of eye shape, this is an oddly shaped eye, but it's fairly typical of raptors uh, where you have a relatively small cornea and a very, very large posterior segment. The lens is here, although it's a little bit hard to differentiate from the vitreous because the vitreous, it has all this white cloudy material in it. Um, this brown object here is the pectin, which is part of the uveal tract that extends up from the optic nerve head. Um, and it is considered to be very important for the nutrition of the retina. And that's because the retina in birds is avascular. So all of the oxygen and nutrients that are delivered to the retina come from either the pectin, which diffuses out through the vitreous or from the choriocapillaris. Um, so we can't really see many other features of this eye, but those are the most important ones. The cornea is a little bit cloudy as well. So, So the lens is artifactually fractured like that. Um, so here's the anterior segment. It's actually pretty um, not exciting. Uh, the iris is a little bit hypercellular, which we'll go higher mag and show you in a bit. As we move back, um, you can kind of appreciate this sort of wispy pink stuff that's in the vitreal space. And that is an indication of the increased protein that's in the vitreous, which is what gave it that cloudy appearance um, grossly. There's our little pectin snaking up into the vitreal space from the optic nerve. And then we have the choroid and the retina here. Um, so really at low mag, there's really not a whole lot that's going on here. But when we go higher mag, I will convince you that there are very significant lesions here. And there are some cover slip scratches, unfortunately, but we'll just ignore those. All right. So starting up at the front, our cornea is artifactually wrinkled. So here is an iris leaflet, lower mag, and then higher mag, iris leaflet that is a little bit hypercellular. And when we go higher mag, we have a mix of cells. So I think a lot of these larger pink cells are actually individual myocytes. So these are striated muscle cells. Um, and then what we have is a mix of mononuclear lymphocytes, or sorry, uh, leukocytes. So we have some cells like this, which are probably plasma cells. Um, and then the smaller ones are probably lymphocytes. Uh, there might also be some histiocytes uh, mixed in here. Um, but I didn't really appreciate many heterophils, at least not in the iris. So the iris definitely has an inflammatory infiltrate. And then we're going to work our way backward. Here's the scleral ossicle. Remember, birds have bone in their scleras which help with accommodation, which means how they focus so very well um, to see things. So as we move backward, this is the choroid. This is the start of the choroid, I think. And uh, it's very purple. And then what we have overlying it is the retina, uh, which is lacking all identifiable retinal layers. And then we have this clumping of pigmented material in the subretinal space. And that is probably a combination of the retinal pigmented epithelial cells that are clumping 
and or macrophages that have picked up melanin from dying retinal pigmented epithelial cells. So we're just going to move back. Just wanted to show you how extensive this was. So here we pick up more recognizable retina. However, even this retina is really sad looking. So we're missing uh, an, the outer nuclear layer of the retina, which is where the photoreceptors reside. And you can see that continued dark purpleness of the choroid, which is indicative of a cellular infiltrate of some sort. As we move back, the retina's layers do become more obvious here. Um, but overall, the pallor of the retina is indicating that there's something not right here. And I'll just tell you right now, it's very extensively necrotic. We're going to keep going. So if you're not used to burnt retinas, you might look at this and be like, ah, not that bad, but they look so much better than this. Just yeah. Sometimes we get wimpy horses and <laughs> yeah. retinas, but this is bad. Yeah. So actually right here, this is the optic nerve right here. Uh, so this is the central area. Um, this is more normal looking retina where we have a really nice band of very dense uh, photoreceptor nuclei. This is our inner nuclear layer. So the second order neurons. And then we have the um, inner plexform layer and here's our nerve fiber layer. The ganglion cell layer is kind of right in here. So this is more normal looking retina. And even in this field, if you compare the, the crispness of the retinal layers on this side of this lesion right here, and this side, you can see how very uh, ill-defined those retinal uh, nuclear layers are over here. So this is an area, this retina is just extensively necrotic. So now let's dive in here. And also just in this space, you can see not only is it necrotic over here, but all of a sudden we lose almost all of those layers altogether. And there's maybe some more significant clumping of that outer or the pigment in the subretinal space. So as we go higher mag, This is just really intense inflammation in this choroid. So this is once again, a mononuclear infiltrate for the most part here, maybe it's, there are probably a few heterophils around, uh, but we have uh, plasma cells like this guy with this little perinuclear clear zone. There he is. And then um, other cells with slightly less cytoplasm, maybe like this guy, uh, which are lymphocytes. And some of them are larger. This guy might be a histiocyte or might be a larger lymphocyte, a lymphoblast or something like that. Um, so they are within and expanding the choroid. And they're also in the choriocapillaris, which is this uh, layer that's right under the retina. We move up into, oops, sorry. Um, so you can kind of appreciate all of those sort of elongated melanin granules. So those are characteristic of those found in the retinal pigmented epithelial cells. So we have disruption and clumping of the retinal pigmented epithelium. Here's an area where we have a bunch of uh, pycnotic nuclear debris. So this is indication that this cell is dead. And then when we move up into the retina, you can see more of that pycnotic nuclear debris and um, that area of retinal necrosis. Real quick, I just wanted to show you that this inflammation does extend up into the pectin, which means we have a pectinitis. That's actually a word. That's pectin spelled P-E-C-T-E-N. We're not talking about what you use to make jelly. Pectin, pectin. So here we go. We just have a similar inflammatory infiltrate in the pectin as well. Uh, so those are the most important lesions in the eye. Um, there's probably a little bit of inflammation in the optic nerve itself, but it wasn't as significant as that seen in oops, the, um, the, the uvea. So let's go back PowerPoint. So uh, this is a severe lymphoplasmacytic panuveitis and pectinitis, su suggestive of West Nile virus infection, which, as I said, was suspected clinically. And it was um, symmetrical and identical in both eyes of this bird. Uh, extensive and severe retinal necrosis and atrophy with retinal pigmented epithelium clumping. So this is um, these are the classic lesions of ocular manifestations of West Nile virus in raptors. Um, West Nile virus can affect many different types of birds, uh, although there is some variation in the susceptibility and it can widely affect almost all body systems. Um, so I was just reading up on it while uh, before rounds. Um, so chickens are not so susceptible, so they can get infected with it, but they aren't really affected by it. And then jays and uh, 
crows and corvids are the ones that are most susceptible to it. And they were the ones that were dropping out of the trees in 1999 when it first uh, landed in New York City. Um, and raptors are also significantly susceptible to it and it can affect almost all body systems. I think one of the more characteristic lesions in raptors is actually the, the what it does to the brain. So obviously that's gonna be really detrimental to any raptor trying to survive. Uh, anyway, so that was just an interesting uh, case of uh, West Nile virus in a red-tailed hawk. So let us move on. Next up, um, we got both eyes from, this one's kind of hot off the press. Uh, we got both eyes from a nine-year-old poodle cocker spaniel mix, so a cockapoo. And the history indicated that there were problems with both eyes. Uh, the left eye was significantly exophthalmic. I believe both eyes were blind. Um, with decreased retropulsion on both eyes. Um, IOPs were normal and there were no corneal lesions, so no fluorescein stain uptake. The Schirmer tear tests were, were uh, Schirmer tear test or the tear production was normal. And so they actually removed both eyes. They did exoneration on both sides and submitted them both to, both to us. So here are both eyes. The left eye, um, you can notice the scale bar is a little bit different between the two images, which indicates it wasn't that this globe was so much tinier than this one. Um, it was that I had to zoom the camera out to get this one in the picture. So there is an off-white mass that is attached to the back of this eye very firmly. Uh, this is the optic nerve. Um, it's always a little bit hard to make your cut when you can't tell where the optic nerve is exiting the eye. Um, and then over here, this is part of the mass that was attached to the right eye. And here you can see the optic nerve head. Both eyes have pretty significant asteroid hyalosis. And other than that, th those are the main lesions. So both eyes have similar lesions histologically, which is kind of interesting. Nine years old. Um, so the lesions in both eyes are similar. I will at least show you one more uh, extensively and show you the second one um, briefly. So here, oh, and I should mention that in the left eye, which is this, oops, I know what I'm doing wrong. There we go. The, the left eye, which is this one, the mask was bigger and it was harder to cut through. So it was a little bit crunchy. So I ended up decalcifying the mass after cutting it in half before processing. Um, so here is, um, let's start at the front. Here's the cornea, iris lens. Uh, here's the back of the eye. So we have retina here. Here's the optic nerve and the optic nerve head. And then here's the mass. So right off the bat, you can see that there are these dark purple areas in the mass. Let's move a little bit further back. I think this is part of the optic nerve poking out the back. And then the mass itself um, is extending out into the orbital tissue. So this is some orbital adipose tissue. This is one of the extraocular muscles, I believe. So it's sort of within the cone at the back of the eye. And you can see here how those little lobules and neoplastic cells are kind of extending out into the adipose tissue. So it is infiltrative. So let's not waste any time. Let's jump right in to what this mass is. And the mass, as I said, in the other eye is very similar looking. From low magnification, you can tell that the mass is forming maybe these sort of ill-defined lobules. All of these little white spots here are actually adipocytes, um, indicating how infiltrative this neoplasm is into the orbital fat. Here's those areas of purpleness, and that's actually mineralized bone. Um, yeah, my decalcification was not complete, and I'm sure the histotechs were swearing at me as they were trying to cut this. Um, but this is an area where those bony trabeculae were decalcified. So, yeah, they actually they did a great job cutting this, which is amazing, uh, despite my not perfect decalcification. So as we go higher, mag, you can see those lobules. Maybe they're, as I said, they're fairly ill-defined. Within the lobules, the cells are forming sheets. And the cells themselves are polygonal with variably distinct cell borders. They have some eosinophilic cytoplasm. And overall, I think the eosinophilia in this section is a little bit increased because of that decalcification. 
Uh, but we have some eosinophilic cytoplasm. We have some round nuclei with some maybe coarsely clumped chromatin and single variably prominent uh, nucleoli. The cells themselves exhibit maybe moderate anisocytosis because they do vary in size a little bit um, and a little bit maybe mild anisokaryosis as well. So they vary a little bit uh, in their nuclear size. The mitotic rate is quite low. I counted one in 10 high powered fields. I did note that there were these um, clumps of cells that have quite vacuolated um, cytoplasm, and I wondered if those were maybe macrophages. And then every now and again, you can maybe pick up some lymphocytes and plasma cells. So there's a smattering of inflammation in this mass as well. The cells really do um, surround and no doubt are responsible for the production of this bone. This is very common in this type of neoplasm. And so the neoplasm closely surrounds and often compresses the optic nerve. So this is really nice where you can see, these are the, this is the meningeal coat right around the optic nerve. And this is an orbital meningioma, which is a meningioma arising from the meninges of the optic nerve. So here you can see how it's directly surrounding the optic nerve at the back of this specimen. So this is the surgical margin here. The optic nerve itself is looking pretty sad. Not a whole lot of um, viable neural pill left here. And that is no doubt due to compression of the nerve by the mass that is filling up that orbital space. Let's quickly look at the rest of the eye. So we have some corneal epithelial hyperplasia and the white space in there is probably edema. So there's some corneal epithelial edema, which is usually an indication of stromal edema. And also you can see this really nice demarcation of the superficial stroma, which is darker pink, a little bit more hypercellular compared to the deeper stroma, which is more normal. And it's a paler pink with less or fewer cells in it. And in that superficial corneal stroma, we've got some blood vessels and this darker pink is an indication of at least what cl it clinically corresponds to corneal stromal fibrosis. That's something that could be argued about amongst pathologists because the cornea is already made of collagen. Anyway, so moving on, the iris and the irritable corneal angle are normal. There is a cataract. So right here, you can see a little bit of liquefaction of the cortical lens fibers in this area, and the lens is not perfectly sampled. As we move back to the um, back of the eye, when we go right adjacent to the optic nerve head here, there is a uh, profound retinal atrophy, full thickness retinal atrophy here. The choroid is a little bit expanded. I think this is some choroidal edema that is probably related to vascular compromise, I would guess, once again, based on the compression of blood vessels by the neoplasm. And then on this side, you can see there's that profound retinal atrophy right adjacent to the optic nerve. And then as we move a little bit further out, you can start to see that the retina does maintain some layering but it also has these big cavities in it. And that is intraretinal edema. It's also called retinoschesis. And that's common when the retina is detached. Um, and we're also lacking most of the retinal layering there. As we move a little bit further out, uh, we have true retinal detachment. And you, can, you know that right off the bat because there is material in the subretinal space. And then this retina over here has relatively more normal layering, at least of the nuclear layers, where we have a nice outer nuclear layer. So that's the photoreceptor layer. Here's the inner nuclear layer. We are actually lacking ganglion cells, and that's no doubt due to, once again, the compression of the optic nerve with um, a retrograde, retrograde um, dying back. Or is that anterograde? I can't remember. Anyway, the retinal ganglion cells are dying. Uh, so there are no more retinal ganglion cells. And then also we have shortening of the photoreceptor inner and outer segments here, which are affectionately called the frilly, fill, frilly frills. Um, so these should be longer and more feathery. In fact, this is probably some of that material, those inner and outer segments that are falling apart here. And that is uh, common when the retina detaches. We have this outer retinal atrophy. Uh, so those are the main lesions. I will quickly show you the other slide just to show you how um, symmetrical this lesion is. 
So here it is on this side. So once again, we have a mass attached to the back of the eye with some mineralized stuff in it. This was not decalcified. So this is what a non-decalcified section looks like. So it's a little bit more purple, but the cells are very similar, similar patterns, similar features. And then we have this like really surprisingly symmetric um, lesion of retinal atrophy and um, the cornea was relatively more normal here. So, oh yeah, and I forgot to point out, here are the asteroid bodies that we saw grossly. I think they weren't well sampled in the other one, possibly the vitreous didn't get well sampled, but these purple blobs are the asteroid bodies making up the asteroid hylosis. Alrighty, so, let's go back to our PowerPoint. So this is a unique case of bilateral orbital slash optic nerve meningioma with loss of retinal ganglion cells, retinal atrophy, and optic nerve head atrophy due to compression by the masses. Um, we have at least one more case of bilateral orbital meningioma in a dog. This is a uh, one of the more common orbital tumors in dogs that we see. They are benign, meaning they don't metastasize. However, the um, difficulty in complete removal often means that they will continue to progress and grow after the initial um, removal. And so they can recur in the orbit. They lead to a compression of the optic nerve head and loss of retinal ganglion cells. And then you can also get exophthalmus. You can get uh, what, um, so you can get exposure, keratitis and ulceration and that kind of stuff. And um, I don't know in this case, I assume that these arose independently of each other. However, another possibility might be that it started in the left, it traveled up the optic nerve to the optic chiasm and then traveled to the right orbit uh, via the right optic nerve and started forming a mass there. I don't know actually what the answer is. Um, I, I can't remember if they did any imaging or not. In the other case, I remember the other, it was a dark suite. And I remember asking that and they did have images and it was, there was no connection between the two. So it can, it sounds kind of far-fetched that you have identical tumors bilaterally, but in that case, that's what they decided. Yeah. Anyway, so interesting case here. Um, overall, good news for the patient, although um, I assume both of these tumors were removed incompletely, and so I assume they will recur. But they're relatively slow growing. Hello, I am Megan Clymans, one of the staff pathologists. I have a very, very simple and a very, very complex case today. And because we have plenty of time, I'm gonna start with a complex case and then tailor the last case to fill the remaining time. So uh, we're gonna start with this one. Uh, this is a 21 year, six month old miniature horse mare. Um, this photo is not our mare. In fact, it's almost certainly not what our mare looked like. For one thing, our mare had blue eyes. Um, However, this uh, photo is representative uh, of at least one possible presentation of one thing that our mare had. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. I'm gonna start by saying that the clinical history on this case um, is that there are overall findings consistent with a diagnosis that I will withhold for now. See if you can come up with that diagnosis uh, yourself. Um, but the probable primary reason why the eye was enucleated and ended up in a jar on our bench um, was more so that there was corneal disease. So there was a deep stromal infected ulcer. They're concerned that it might be fungal keratitis, um, and then also a significant chronic uveitis, um, maybe a reflux uveitis associated with this corneal disease. Um, so um, a certain condition that is underlying, um, and see if you can pick up on it, and corneal disease, <clears throat> we'll start with this gross photo um, that's sort of representative. Um, and I thought this was just a cool photo um, pulled from Dr. DeBilzig's comparative ocular path book. We have a horse eye that is still in situ, um, and we're looking at the front of it. We have the iris here. So we have the iris there, and then the iris continues along the ventral pupillary margin. However, peeking out from behind that iris, we have these little plicae. And so this is actually pars placata of ciliary body peeking out from behind a very foreshortened iris. 
Um, and it's unusual even with really significant midriasis to see the ciliary body when looking into the front of the eye. So we assume that this iris is uh, too little, too little iris. Um, and as such, the diagnosis in this case would be iris hypoplasia. So interesting. <clears throat> we'll revisit this in a moment. And sadly, there's no gross photo of this case. There's no need to belabor this point. However, in Which my opinion- Which is my fault, it's Gillian's fault. There is no need to belabor this point. <laughs> <laughs> it was a slightly collapsed looking globe. It may not have made for a very good gross photo. And we have lovely histologic lesions. Self snitching here. I know. Yeah. Well, people, the, the audience may have been wondering why there was no gross photo. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if that's the case. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, writer. Thank you. So I'm actually going to start with the radial sections of this horse's globe, and then we'll look at the whole hemisected view. And actually, before I do that, here I went over this stuff in, in advance, and then uh, I'm not doing it in the order that I wanted to do it in. So uh, before I do that, let's talk about some of the gross notes for this horse, um, because some of these things won't necessarily show up well in histology. So we have a description of a hole in the cornea, laterally and paraxially, um, and the cornea is slightly cloudy around the hole. So there's our uh, corneal disease. Um, and then the cornea is large and protruding. So that's interesting. So a very large and protruding cornea, um, we could potentially call either cornea globosa or megalocornea. Um, so we have some gross suggestion of that condition, very interesting. Um, and then another gross note uh, says that the uh, horse's eye seems to be relatively small. And so that is relatively small compared to most horse eyes that we get in Copla, which are usually full-size horse eyes. Um, and I think this case illustrates one of the reasons why we typically don't do measurements of our globes, like a diameter of the globe or things like that, even though a measurement is a more scientific way of determining size. Um, in Coppola, we get a wide variety of species. Within each species, we get a wide variety of breeds or sort of subspecies. Um, so ultimately, these animals can be all shapes and sizes, and the uh, size of the globe even measured may not necessarily tell us much about whether it is enlarged or decreased in size relative to what it should be for this patient. And indeed, we have a miniature horse here. So potentially the smallish looking size on gross exam could be just her eye size. Um, and without context, it's difficult for us to be sure. Um, so however, this is a well-formed and relatively small eye. Uh, and so our differentials would be some degree of microphthalmia versus just appropriate for a miniature horse, small eye. Um, so now we've gone over the gross, let's go back to our histology and keep going with that. So we have these radial sections of the globe. And let's orient you here. Here's the iris back here. And as we walk along the cornea to this paraxial site, we have this spot in the cornea where the epithelium is extending full thickness through. And if we zoom in on that. And focus. So we have reptilium wrapping completely around this discontinuity in the corneal stroma and onto the back of the cornea even. And if we walk further along, we see decimase membrane coming back in. And we can see that on the other side as well. And so we don't quite have a hole at this level of the cornea, um, but we can assume that we are basically right at the edge of that corneal perforation site. The epithelium wouldn't have been able to extend full thickness through the cornea without there being a hole here. Um, so corneal perforation, check. Um, we also have a pretty severe keratitis around, but in particular with respect to the keratitis, I want to show you this section. So in this section from low magnification, we have some basophilia up top here in the superficial to mid stroma, but also some basophilia in the deep stroma. And they were concerned about fungal keratitis in this case, which is a pretty common cause of infectious keratitis of horses. If you're concerned about fungal keratitis, I do recommend as a pathologist looking in the deep stroma and the decimase membrane in particular, fungus loves decimase membrane. It's like a big pink fettuccine full of lovely carbs. Delicious. Um, however, when we look closer at this basophilia and we pick a really good one and zoom in as far as we can go. That's as far as we can go. Aren't they cute? They're adorable. 
So it turns out this is actually bacteria. So we do indeed have a form of infectious keratitis, but not fungus, but instead bacteria. Uh, these are actually little bacilli. It may be hard to tell with the camera, um, but it's lousy with bacilli. This is a very infected deep corneal stroma. Um, so we have a, a reason for uh, our severe corneal disease in this case. And this is probably the main reason why the horse actually lost her eye, the corneal disease. However, that's not all. There is much more to see in this eye. Gesundheit. So if we go back to this slice here, and while we were looking at the iris earlier, you may have noticed some abnormalities, and if so, good eye. Because we have the iris base, let's start here. The iris base is here. We have pectinate ligaments here. So we're kind of at the iridocorneal angle there. So all of this extending to the left should be a iris leaflet. However, on the back of this iris leaflet for a significant distance along its length, there are ciliary body plicae. And they are lined by their typical two layer epithelium, both a pigmented and a non-pigmented. And the ciliary body plicae should not be at this location. They should start back here, at least past the iridocorneal angle level. Um, so this is abnormal. Um, maybe for a rabbit, you can have the first one or two ciliary body plicae extending from the back of the iris at its base, but not along its whole length practically like this and not in a horse. So um, we have some degree of malformation of the iris and ciliary body. Um, which you could potentially use the term anterior segment dysgenesis. Basically, it's a dysgenic change and it's of the anterior segment. Uh, although be cautious because anterior segment dysgenesis may describe kind of a more specific type of malformation. Um, you can also just give this a descriptive morph. But in addition, as we zoom in on this iris leaflet, particularly here near the pupillary margin, there's not much to it. It's pretty much just smooth muscle and then the pigmented iris epithelium back here. So even here where the ciliary body isn't really uh, doing its weird mispositioning thing, this iris is pretty wimpy. Um, a couple of fits, my tears there too. <laughs> dang it, I was hoping to just ignore these, <laughs> but Leandro spawned them. Um, these are weird and I don't know what to make of them. That's we'll right. see some more weirdnesses oh, later though. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Gillian's remembering something else. She's seen this one before too. Um, so wimpy iris, there's barely any stroma to this. It's pretty much just it's smooth muscle and epithelium. And so we can also call iris hypoplasia. It comes full circle back to our representative clinical photo. Um, yes, oh yes, thank you. Um, and also it's worth noting at this point, um, we mentioned that uh, at the start that this mare has blue eyes and we can tell this uh, by this histologic image as well. The iris stroma, such as it is, uh, doesn't really have any melanocytes in it. Um, and so blue eyes are like that. The stroma lacks melanocytes, um, but they do still have the pigmentation in the posterior pigmented iris epithelium. Um, if an animal uh, has true albinism, no melanin anywhere, then there won't be any melanin in any part of the iris. Um, so Let's keep walking along this iris stroma back to where there actually is more stroma to the iris. And as we walk along, we'll see some more fun things. Did ignore that for sure. <laughs> I'm not sure what to, what to make of it. Um, hang sure. on a second. <laughs> yeah, those, those weird basophilic, actually now I'm missing where my, maybe Don't it was in the it. iris, other iris leaflet. Yeah. There are other changes to see, but this is, these are the weird basophilic things that we mentioned before. Um, Let's see. I think actually it might have been the other iris leaflet. There we go. Okay. We're going to head to the other iris leaflet. We're going to walk back towards the base. And as we go, we start to see some weird things. So this is at least more recognizable as mineralization. So there's overt mineralization in this iris, presumably some degree of a dystrophic process, tissue injury, and then mineralization. We also have these random ganglion cells hanging out in the middle of the iris stroma, not really forming like a discrete ganglion, uh, you know, cl like a cluster. They're just kind of hanging out here. So that's weird. <laughs> um, and then actually let's go full higher mag and look around those ganglion cells. Solar elastosis. Yeah, exactly. As Leandra says, what the heck? Solar elastosis, <laughs> question mark, question mark. Um, so indeed we have these uh, serpiginous strands of basophilic material in the iris stroma. 
Uh, if you were looking at conjunctiva, you would probably diagnose this as solenoastosis or actinic change uh, and be done with it. So basically this is uh, the result of chronic uh, UV light exposure, more, uh, most typically, at least at our other typically more superficial or ocular surface type sites. Um, as far as anyone who was looking at the slide originally can remember, uh, we haven't really seen solar elastosis in the iris before. So this is weird. No. Um, yeah, Leandro agrees. Haven't seen it before in the iris. Um, I have some pet theories about why it's Tell us your theories, Megan. Tell, tell, tell us our pet theories. Okay, so it's purely speculative. Um, but this horse is a blue-eyed horse, so there's probably not a lot of pigmentation in and around the eye. Um, and the horse uh, possibly has cornea globosa or megalocornea. So I wonder if this horse has a very big window letting in a lot of light and not a lot of melanin pigment to kind of block that light. And maybe this has resulted in an unusual case of solar elastosis in the iris of all places. Um, but purely speculative, um, a very unusual finding at the site, however. I think maybe it also could have been focusing oh, it on yeah. like a magnifying like, glass like because, of, maybe. because of the curvature, like, yeah, magnifying yeah, glass. Yeah. Yeah. Like how you're wearing oh, ants when you're. Okay. <laughs> how some people <laughs> <laughs> treated ants when they were little, perhaps. <laughs> this is impressive. Yeah. This one was abnormal Maybe. in this eye. We do have a corpora nigra. Um, and then I feel like I don't have the context to decide whether it's small. I mean, it is, right. does look relatively small compared to other horses. We can at least say that. Yeah, um, the iris, but it's everything you saw out of proportion, right? It's yeah. Hard to judge. Yeah. Hard, hard without context, basically. We need a, a control eye, basically. Um, so, and then, yeah, it's a good thing to ask because the corpora nigra is kind of like the sunshade of the eye. It's this lovely uh, ruffled border at the pupillary margin. Um, also, can I share my gross note on the- Oh, please do. Okay. So um, I said that um, the pupillary margin is brown all the way around. So I could not specifically identify granular radica hmm. of the corpora nigra. Anyway, so that was kind of interesting, which is a feature of this syndrome. Indeed. Supposedly. Yeah. <laughs> which I Googled before I grossed it because I was like, what should I be looking for? <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> uh, same. So um, we uh, go back to the iridocorneal angle and there are some other things, but I'm going to switch to the full section of the eye now that we've fully examined this iris leaflet and all of the wonders it has to offer. So where's the... The horse geographically located? Northeastern United States. Alright. <laughs> so. Mm. Nope, that's the back. Let's go to the front. So in this case, the iris leaflets kind of got artificially chopped off. So those aren't as pretty. However, the angles are kind of prettier and nicer to look at in this section. So let's drop down on this. And when we look closer at the iris base and the pectinal ligaments here, right where they meet the terminus of decimase membrane, we have this thick layer of decimase membrane covering the pectinal ligaments on both sides as they kind of come in at the iridocorneal angle here. So this finding is referred to as pectinal ligament decimatization. Now, uh, there is a paper published on this condition uh, that uh, finds a strong correlation between a uh, pectinal ligament decimatization in horses and age. And this is a 21 year old mare. So this is quite an old mare. Uh, and therefore this may just be some degree of aging change. Uh, I did bring along a comparison, which was a case we also got around the same time and was my original comparison as well. So ignore the endophthalmitis mitis for now. We're gonna go over here to the dorsal where there's less end up. So here's a big corpora nigra in a more you know, full size horse by comparison as well. That's kind of helpful. And then over here at the iridocorneal angle, this is what you would call sort of a definitely normal looking horse iridocorneal angle. They have quite thick pectinate ligaments. And then there's maybe a little bit of decimase membrane kind of covering the ends of the pectinate ligaments where they meet the terminus, but it's not as robust as in the horse we just looked at. Um, this one was five years old. So a much younger horse. Um, so uh, we have this pectinate ligament decimatization. In our horse, uh, our 21 year old mare, um, I think it could either be aging change or because this eye has so many different congenital malformations, it could also be a congenital issue, um, basically some degree of malformation of the iridocorneal ankle. So those are the two differentials for that lovely change. And also 
a little plug to note that in an older horse, don't overinterpret pectinal ligament decimatization. Could just be an aging thing. You can see that even more robustly on this level, even though there's a lot of artifact at this level. Really significant pectinal ligament decimatization in this animal. And then while we're still up here on the anterior uvea spending some time, we can confirm their clinically diagnosed uveitis. So we have lots of lymphocytes and plasma cells infiltrating the iris and ciliary body surface uh, stroma. Presumably a reflex uveitis uh, associated with really severe corneal disease in this case, although it could also have been associated with cataract. Where are you? Cataract. It actually was up there. So walking back to the lens from the anterior uvea, we do have a cataract, and this is the posterior surface of the lens. We can tell because the posterior lens capsule is much thinner, and the posterior lens capsule is actually doubled to tripled in this case, and between those layers of, so lens capsule, lens capsule, lens capsule, and between those layers, there's this thick sort of disorganized collagen that's been deposited. Um, so uh, this is a cataract, and because uh, it's sort of close to the posterior pole or so of the lens uh, and associated with abnormalities of the posterior lens capsule, this doubling to tripling, um, I am suspicious that this is uh, some co component of a congenital cataract. Um, difficult to be sure, we have our context clues in this horse eye to suggest that there may be reasons for congenital malformation, um, which is part of why I would be more inclined to do DDX this as a congenital condition in the lens. So we've got a cataract. And then if we continue walking back to back of the eye, I gave you a sneak preview. So let's start at the optic nerve. And if we look at the retina on this side, this is actually the ventral retina, um, it looks pretty okay. We've got normal layers, we've got uh, a fair, a fair number of ganglion cells. It's difficult to subjectively evaluate numbers of ganglion cells in a horse, um, but it looks normal, normal retina eventually. We walk back the other way and start in on the dorsal retina. We have a fairly normal retina centrally, but as we go, it starts to get a little bit more abnormal. There's some disorganization of the layers. There's these rosettes kind of forming here or there. There's uh, outer nuclear, uh, out, sorry, outer retinal atrophy with loss of the photoreceptor segments and the uh, outer nuclear layer. And we keep seeing that as we progress along. So we keep going. Wow. Was it a DV section? Yeah. That's a lot of things. So yeah. Of Should be. Was it a DV section to confirm so. for me? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Horses are hard to cut horizontally. Yeah. Indeed. Here we go. We have another area where the outer uh, photoreceptor segments and the outer nuclear layer is beginning to be lost and it gets very thin. And then suddenly the RPE cells are either lost or kind of uh, distorted by this fibrous tissue. We have full thickness, segmental or focal disorganization of the retina. And we keep seeing this type of a thing as we go along with in between those areas. It could be glial tissue too. Glial, yeah, yeah gliosis, good point, glial. good point. Oh, time. Oh, time. Goodness. Um, so there's RV hypertrophy showing that we have multifocal retinal detachment. Uh, and <laughs> goodness, I used all the time for this case. I thought I would. It's very complex. Um, and more rosettes. So we have basically multifocal retinal dysplasia and multifocal retinal detachment. Um, so uh, there's a long list of conditions in this horse's eye, many of which are congenital. And if uh, you've had some time to formulate your diagnosis, hopefully. Um, I will now give it away as uh, multiple congenital ocular anomalies pro appropriately named in the horse. And that is what they said clinically, finding consistent with MCOA, um, which is a, a promelanocortin mutation in horses and associated with the silver hair coat, which this horse did have, um, silver coated horse. Um, so uh, lots of things to talk about in this patient. And if I can get it to go, there we go. Here's a list. Um, I've separated out the cornea stuff from the multiple congenital ocular anomaly stuff. Uh, and we have our diagnoses here. Um, so that's it. And we're over time at this point. So if anyone has any questions, let us know. And we'll save the simple case for later. Thanks everyone for joining us. See you guys in two weeks. Thank you.
stop recording.